I mean, I, okay, I can start. Um, so this particular work is called Whose World Is This? And um, I am looking at a couple of things. So be, below the black line, you have uh, representation of things like uh, scientific racism. I just realized how long I was holding my eyes. That's funny, because um, I, I was organizing my thoughts. Um, so you have a uh, representation of, of scientific racism. You have um, some of the, the people that have throughout the years collected skulls of people of color. Um, representation of that is there. Um, there's even some of the tools that have been used throughout the years to do studies on women of color and or people of color in general. Um, uh, and then, of course, it starts with, with oh, so I do not have any references of slavery in that one. Interesting. Um, so then I bring you up, um, this is the one where I mentioned the Avery. so basically, because the majority of these people that I'm refer referencing in this particular work are people that were caged in, or people of color that were put in cages, put in exhibitions f to be viewed, to be consumed in that way. So you have Ish Ishii, um, who was, uh, I don't remember the actual tribe that he was part of, but he was um, a descendant <coughs> of Native Americans. And he came out, he was one of the only, I think he was, he was in, basically they killed off his whole He was one of the last, and, and at one point, 30 years after, he basically came out of, of the, um, the jungle, if I'm not mistaken, and, and was brought into society in that, in that era. Um, so, I, I reference him. Um, I do, I do. I do talk about extinct animals or endangered animals, because I think there's a conversation to be had about how we treat beings whether they're animals and or, or, or human beings, um, we have not fully taken responsibility of the impact of our behaviors and the atrocities that we, we have attributed to and on, on each other um, and our land and our uh, other beings that are part of this world. So I absolutely have a whole bunch of extinct and or endangered animals in that work. So um, then you have Odebenga. Odebenga, forgive me. This date, I forgot exactly where he was from the continent of Africa, but um, he was brought here. And it's interesting because there's always a, just, there's always a, a conversation about whether or not people went willingly, people were taken willingly. And that's a whole other conversation. But literally, he was also caged in the, in the Bronx Zoo um, and, and shown with monkeys. Um, and I, I won't go into how problematic that is. And then you have Sarah Bartman or Saki Bartman. Um, who was also um, put into a situation or had to make the choices that put her into a situation uh, similar to that. And um, then around, around the, the inside of the circular uh, glass or magnifying, um, around them are individuals that were part of the World Fair, the World Expo throughout a series of years. And they literally brought people from around the world into so that the average day citizen of that time period, of the for, for many years actually, and it tracked, yeah, I think the really original one was in Chicago, um, that they were set up as exhibition. And um, the treatment of these, of these folks was, was not ideal. Um, and in this one, I specifically decided to keep them all in black and white. And even in, in the slavery uh, works, um, I wanted, I printed it so that you would not be able to recognize the face, right? I want you to recognize the soul. I want you to recognize that these are human beings. And even in this one, they're not all people of African descent. Um, they're a range of people from across the world, and you can't necessarily decipher that in this work. And I'm, I'm actually okay with that because I'm pointing out that this is an issue about people of color, period. This is about melanated people. This is about different cultures than the, the what is that word? Than um, people that are of European descent, basically. So, I would love, I mean, I want to hear you talk about them all. So we don't have all day. Um, we may want to talk about the Montgomery Brawl one because 
it's a little bit different than the others. But I want to give you a little break, and I know we want to have um, everyone else here have a chance to offer questions as well. I think we started about 15 minutes late, so we'll go about 15 minutes more. Um, so let me just turn back to um, Jack and Maria and ask you another kind of more general question about Amber's work, which is kind of why you think it's important for visual artists who are doing work, and especially Amber's work, this really complex, colorful collages, um, canvases, quilts. Why is it important that visual artists are doing work, or that Amber is doing this work, um, in a time and place and world where there are so many? I mean, as you point out, there are so many kind of human rights issues and um, struggles still happening. Um, and you know, we talked about the conversations that your work has with the Washington Color School or with the anthropological work that you're doing. Um, but I guess just to say a little bit more about what it is, why is this work important? Maybe if you want to start. Sure. Yeah, I'm looking on my notes. But I know you think. Uh, in India. So, um, I will emphasize art as this powerful tool for change, as I mentioned earlier. And if we did have, we could have an impact that all the books, all the articles, and so forth might not have because they might never reach uh, some people. And uh, here I would love to emphasize as well um, three things. So land and territory would be one. So when we look at Amber's uh, art, we can automatically connect our own stories and histories. And then um, thinking about your former question on global indigenous communities and struggles, and there's a term that you might be familiar with or not that's called locality. So it's uh, thinking globally, acting locally, which kind of goes hand in hand with what I was mentioning before, right? So who am I in this particular geography? And then um, what are the global and local issues affecting my communities and other communities that are close to my heart? So um, that's one. And then I would love to emphasize as well what I mentioned before, related with belonging and this sense of community, which goes with human dignity. So with everything that's happening, we were talking about before uh, we start, started our panel, every single human being deserves human dignity, independently of how you look, who you are, what's your home country, whether you are documented or not, whatever. Um, your religious or spiritual beliefs are, human dignity is not for some and not for others. But then we have uh, authority and usually male bodies, I have to say, throughout history that decide on whose bodies matters, basically. Who matters more than less? And um, Amber's work does a beautiful, painful work of reminding everyone, right? Slavery, colonialism, and we need to think, we were talking about that before, that that's in the past, right? I remember when I was a professor, I had to really work with my students to kind of bring them to the sense that that historical legacy is still with us. It's transformed, right? It takes different shapes, different forms, even different languages, right? Uh, if, I'm sure you have noticed now that we have social media and so forth, uh, people that are extremely discriminatory towards other people now use the human rights language to discriminate against others, which you know, 10 years ago, probably impossible, that was unthinkable. Now, it's like taking the human rights language and using it in a way that continues to be discriminatory. So then, Art as a tool to change, as a hope. When I think about human dignity, I always bring hope. And that's, I feel like, another way in which um, Amber and I connected. Because she's, she's reminding us about our historical legacies and what we can do, what type of interaction, interventions we can do, whomever we are in the world, 
and also what's our responsibility towards other other communities, right? That um, communities of color, communities of color. For example, if we keep adding LGBTIQ plus communities of color that are also undocumented, that also have a religious belief that is not the mainstream, um, and so forth. You, you can keep adding age <laughs> and, um, um, I'm thinking about a word in, in Spanish and not in English, but um, discapacidad. Discap disability, for example, and so forth. So bringing and understanding how history is informing ourselves, our own wounds, uh, our own how we carry family trauma, and then how we have different belongings. Doing that with hope in the center really could create a change that we want to see. So hope in the middle of our conversation. And how do you feel about her uh, bringing up Franz Boas and, and uh, sort of an implicit critique of the anthropological enterprise? I, I yeah. love that. Yes. You know, there's Absolutely. something for everybody here to, to, <laughs> yes. to start, you know, start questioning. Yes. I mean, I, you know, kind of an answer to your question, uh, I think that by its very nature, sort of the creative part of this operation is it's it's a challenge, you know, to the status quo. Because you're changing, you know, you're changing. And it's you are artists are basically subversive. You know, they're because they're un, they're they're examining the status quo and they're going to uh, proper change. And that's so important. Now, some artists don't. Uh, certainly, we talked about the color school, and um, and that was always fascinating to me. That you know, here we are in Washington D.C., and there's the Vietnam War, and there's assassination, and there's riots in the streets, and the city is literally burning, and they're painting stripes. You know, so, but but there are lots and lots of examples of artists throughout history that you know really tackled what was going on. Uh, you know, on a, on a different level with human beings, and really, uh, you know, it's not a mirror, but you know, it's really showing us ourselves. You know, it's it's uh, it, that to me is the real value uh, of art. Is you know, it's very selfish. I want to learn about myself, and this is sort of a way, you know, uh, through the artist's you know expression. Uh, so that's it's a very you know worthwhile endeavor. You know, to make and to, and to work. It's really, really important. So I'd love to hear if any of you have questions or comments um, or any of the viewers. Pressure. <laughs> no pressure. There's so many elements of you know, themes of intersectionality that is, you know, all presented throughout all of the work. There's a lot of the events that have, tried, that have transpired since October 7th and the conversation that I had with Israel and how that have you thought about how your artwork fits into those conversations as well and how you think they might fit in a very different way or how it applies to this group? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we, we talked about this briefly right before you know, we started the panel. So, one of the things that I am, I, I think, introducing in this body of work, where, where I will be going in one of my next bodies of work, is a conversation about um, inheritance to some extent, right? Because we, we our society wants to live with property, but inheritance, you know, is when it comes to those um, people that we want to keep in a certain subjugated group. That it goes one way, right? They act this way because of this. They act this way because of that. Um, and I, in my works, I, I have been trying to point out that inheritance goes both ways. It's, it's if it's not selective inheritance. We, we, I, I really believe that we, we are 
product of a society that doesn't want to take responsibility for even our own behaviors and then the behaviors of those before us. And then we have to put it off on the people that we know the behavior has been put on, imposed on, forced on. We don't take, um, we don't want to look at the fact that it's, there's a doer and it's something that's being done to you, people that are being done to you. So, and I, I sound a little, um, so I feel the heaviness on me now because I'm talking about it, because I don't know how else to heal unless we look at the behavior, the patterns, the societal patterns of what we do to maintain power and maintain money. And that's, to me, that can be seen in any culture on this planet. People that, it, it's replicated. Um, and I, I, it's a heavy thing, but how do you, how do you escape it when you, every time it's just pushed off to the side, ignored, bombed? Um, I see this as a, as a, it's not, I'm not directly talking about people of God, Palestinians in this work, but I'm talking about this cycle in the work that I'm, it's just a different ethnicity, different part of the world, um, but it's about control, it's about control and power. years or so ago, you opened my eyes to a lot of this. I was merrily walking along thinking that you resolved a lot of issues in the world, and you shook me hard and said that was not the case. And I see your work, I have seen the work that you've done in the last few years as being very much witness panels. I mean, this work, I think, fits in with it. I, I don't know if that's what they are for you, and maybe you can speak to that, but I see them as ways of witnessing. They don't seem to see the solution because there isn't going to be a change in the power. But they seem to me to be very much a documentation of sort of the past and the future together. That's deep. Do you remember what I said? Not you don't have to give me verbatim. I hope I was polite. Um, <laughs> well, actually, it was uh, I mean, it had to do with the fact that I thought things were resolving. Mm -hmm. And you were like, no way. You are just not paying attention. And I mean, this was a good, it was, it was over 12, 13 years ago. So it was a while ago. It was during the Obama administration. And I thought, you know, we were merrily moving in a better direction. And you were very clear to me that you thought things were still, you know, not good. And I think that that's a lot of what you say in this work is, am I not, what, what do you think about that? Oh, yeah, uh, we have ways to go. We have, we have ways We're going to go. backwards. In some yeah. sense we are, <laughs> <laughs> depending, yes. depending on what, what, yeah. Yeah. But is there hope? I mean, I, I have to believe that there is. I, you know what's unfortunate though? I, I feel as though, yes, some of it has to, um, to come from the people that are in power, right? Um, <laughs> I roll my eyes. <laughs> and, and that's, that's, I was going to say, that's, that's a conversation for almost well, for another day. But it also has to come from those that are being oppressed and those that are being subjugated. Because one of the ways in which um, that is successfully uh, executed is by singling us, by siloing us, by separating us and disconnecting us from each other. Um, and so, for example, the fact that we, that I'm sure that there, I hope that there will be hundreds of thousands of people that will show up for the, the, the march this Sunday in, in the city today, you know, and even in some of the, the conversations that I've seen throughout, even before what happened in, this, um, in October, um, there have been people that are going 
um, Palestinians and, and African, people of African descent, specifically African Americans, have been having an interconnected conversation about um, being under colonial imperialist rule. And that needs to continue. Now, the, the thing is, is that it also needs to span the globe. Um, and we have to start looking at each other differently. The people in power need to, to, at least in my opinion, need to come to terms with what their role, active, everyday role, you know, when it comes to the fact that these are human beings you're referring to, not just beings that you happen to be in, in a place of authority and, and or control over, but also we have to collectively um, like wash our eyes of the lens in which um, have been imposed on us. Um, and that, that is, to me, that's critical. It's absolutely critical because how you see yourself and then how you see other people that are either the same ethnicity, skin tone, whatever it is, or whatever, religion, um, it's, it's, it restrains you and it keeps you in the mindset of what I would consider to be um, a form of survival, a, a form of, what's that, that term, Stockholm Syndrome, where you are, and this is where, for me, this is where epigenetics comes in, because you are replicating what was once done to you, even if it is four generations ago. And you don't see it, you don't feel it, you don't, you don't question until you are in a situation that is, that is dire and the mirror is turned on you. And I feel for some of the people that are online and, and, and doing crazy stuff um, as though it's, it's funny it's what's being done to people in, in, you know, in another part of the world. Um, and I feel like one day your, your, your daughter, your son, your cousin, your mother is going to see these things. Or someone that you care about, that they, you care about their opinion of you. Can you imagine what that's going to, to I don't know. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> and I thank you, hold on real quick. I thank you for sharing that with me. <coughs> I'm sorry, I don't think correctly. But this sort of curious that the new is this term sort of veered into the conversation around technology. How does that sort of complicate where we're heading? If you're thinking about this information that we're interacting in this age, um, the advent of AI, um, not a really solid global policy around how these technologies are going to be used. These are really sort of complicated moments. Um, are you thinking about this and then you're looking at the future in terms of what will be incorporated as you go? I do think about those things. I think about them because they're scary. AI, AI is an absolutely human system tool, but AI is another way of, because of who constructs, who constructs these programs, the data in which it's being collected and utilized for these programs are impacted by this patriarchal and, and um, white dominant society. And because the, the, the biases, the, the, the problems with um, the, the, the racial societies that we live in, whether it's class, and it doesn't matter, like this can, this can also be a problem, like for example, in India, you have a class system that's set up in which to, to treat particular people that are from a certain area, from a certain religion, and, and whether they are, are honest about it or not, colorism, right? And if you have the data that is going into these systems that is biased, then it's going to be putting out biased and racist um, information and, and all the ways in which that uh, information can you know, dis disperse. And I'm not saying all of it is bad, but, okay, so how am I gonna answer that? The lens in which I, I look at this work is through human ecology, right? Human ecology is based on the systems in which we have orchestrated some of our natural based systems, right? Uh, meaning with the science of our world, but others are in things that have happened in terms of what we've created, industrial systems and computer, things like that, that we have then put these systems on top of our society, right? And the thing about human ecology is it very rarely speaks to racism. Racism is prevalent. Anti-blackness is prevalent around this, this globe that we 
inhabit, right? Um, and until that is addressed, there is remnants of that understanding of our human existence that are going to impact everything we create. How could it not when we haven't dealt with it as a society? Does that make sense? I think we can certainly continue this conversation, and I know that we will. Um, we probably need to wrap up the panel, and I just want to come back to your question, is there hope? And I think, you know, <laughs> you know Jack talked about artistic, invention, artistic intervention and the power that can have. Right. And Maria mentioned keeping hope in the center, and I think these works literally do that with the way that they're composed and then looking into the globe and looking at kind of the future. Um, and I just think that the work that Amber's doing and the fact that she's doing it, it's giving us this sense of hope. It's giving us this possibility to both see these incredible objects and think really deeply about these important issues. So um, I want to thank all of our panelists. I want to thank everyone who came out today, despite the traffic and the construction and all the things. Um, it's been wonderful. Thank you. So there is something I want to say real quick. Sorry. <laughs> so one of the things I, I wanted to have an action for people to walk away with, not just to see the work. Of course I want you to see the work and appreciate the work. But there's a couple things, like there are uh, QR codes. One is by um, the Cap and All Slavery, I'm sorry, and the Slave Patrol of Bungal Communities. And I think that one is for, what is that one for, Amy? Shoot, I forgot. But that's the United Nations. Yes, so the United Nations has, come, has I don't know how old it is, but they have what's um, what they're referencing as civil human rights. So you know, if you decide to use your phone, um, pull it up, and just review what the United Nations, which is you know, and it has its faults, and it's a whole other conversation. But they have a a description of what we all should have innately as being human beings on this daggone planet. Okay. So then you have H HR 40, and that is referencing, you know, um, I have two that are referencing reparations and or, uh, yeah, reparations. One is a, a very particular to California. California has a reparations program that they, they are, I think, pretty sure are about to actually institute. And then you have one that is on a congressional level that they are trying to um, put into law and or do the research to eventually put it into law. Um, and even if you don't do those things, I mean, I really suggest the, the human rights because that is at the core of what, what the, the um, what's happening to the Palestinians and, 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 uh, and in Gaza um, is because if we all had human rights, we would not be in this situation. Um, and I do want to do real quick, because uh, there is hope. <laughs> I have to believe there is hope. And I would like the, uh, the panelists to just either say something in relationship to, to what they're hopeful for um, and or give advice as to how to progress to move forward in, um, in making sure that you are part of that hope. Does that make sense? I think these paintings, I forget what you called them, uh, Witness. But but they're you know they're flags or mentor flags. They're like really uh, in that sense a call to action. You know that uh, this is something that uh, once you once you experience, you're meant to take something away and do something. And I think that's that's fantastic. That's the that's the what we really want to hope for in art. I think. Yeah, in my case, I will highlight solidarity. So how can we um, exercise solidarity, empathy, rapport, especially with those communities that don't look like us? Which means, again, kind of stepping out of our comfort zone. And as you were saying, which I think is so valuable, if I feel like things are going well, is it going well for, for my community? And then how is it going for other communities, right? That requires, again, kind of these exercise of stepping out and reaching out and which again takes a lot of work right and not everyone everyone wants to do the work not everyone will do the work that's okay um, but for those who have 
the, the willingly, willingness or yeah. wanting to learn to feel like, well, did I be? And then also, I didn't mention that because you know, so, such little time, so many things to share. Um, but looking at solidarity movements, like in Ecuador, you have different indigenous mm -hmm. organizations and women led, like Amazon led indigenous organizations that we have worked with and collaborated with. It's called, one is called Parayaku, you have Andean indigenous communities. Uh, one is called Skinti Warmi in the original Quichua indigenous language in Ecuador. Warmi means woman. And what they do, for example, is um, interrupt mining and mining companies and all um, you know, the, the negative impact that they have in the community through art. For example, uh, by doing this type of um, bracelets, which has specific needs from the community by the women, so kind of braiding, kneading, uh, connecting with nature, what you were saying, and then bringing it back. To the world also as a way of uh, art therapy, as a way of income. And I feel like um, newspapers and so forth, both digital and printed, don't show us enough these beautiful ways where people are organizing here in Washington DC, in the state, in Palestine, in, in Israel, uh, you name it, in Sudan, in Ecuador, everywhere. They are always, and that's the beauty of being an anthropologist, is that I'm always in contact with communities that are organizing, interrupting creatively, peacefully, uh, resisting um, everything that uh, Amber is kind of reminding us. So how, for example, an action, like how can we support these communities, right? How, what can we learn from these communities that maybe we can incorporate it in our own? Um, and then lastly, I have to say, unless Sarah, you want to say something? No, go ahead. Okay, so when earlier in this conversation we talked about the Washington Color School and, and, and I mentioned the concept of I cannot just only create. So I need to contextualize that because creating, you know, and same, me and Mr. Gillian used to have this, this conversation all the time, this, this back and forth that we had. So the act of creating, deciding that you are going to live your life as an artist, whether and or follow your passion, specifically as a person of color, that is in defiance of the greater majority. Okay, so I don't want to take anything away from that. Um, that is an act of defiance. It is an act of a revolution. It is, it, it, and it is beyond what I would consider um, like a normative type of action, okay? Um, that is absolutely going against the grain. Now, I am absolutely saying that I cannot just create things that are at least, every body of work cannot just be something that is only focusing on aesthetics. That's my choice. I need to, to feel like I am an active contributor to this world and the issues that we have. And so part of the ways in which I'm doing that is creating works that talks about the dynamics of these various, you know, concept institutions, overall arching <laughs> bad things that affect people, human beings, every day in our lives. So I wanted to clarify, just for me, um, that's important. Mm -hmm. So thank you everybody for being here. I appreciate you all. Thank <laughs> you.